Jason Artisone West, uh, you were the production designer for NBC's live production of Jesus Christ Superstar uh, this past Easter. Uh, how did you come to be a part of the project? Um, it, it was sort of a surprise to me, to be honest with you. I, I just got a call from my agent one day who told me to sit down. Uh, he had some exciting news for me. And um, uh, to make a long story short, uh, an amazing designer I've worked with for a number of years, as Devlin, had recommended me to the director, David Laveau. And so David was keen to, to work with me, I think, because I had a combination of, of um, history designing theater concerts. Or I used to be an architect, um, sort of this you know interesting combination of, of design history that seemed to be just right for this project. And, um, and so I met David and Neil and uh, was offered the job pretty quickly, which was a wonderful surprise. <laughs> and how well did you know, uh, yeah, Jesus Christ Superstar before uh, taking on this production? You know, not super deeply. I, I obviously knew I had heard it before, um, but I, I really rediscovered it through this project, and um, I it was just sort of blown away by the power of the music. Um, was just delighted to get to work on it. There's so much. Obviously, the source material is very rich, uh, as is the. Uh, the, the musicality of it, and so there was a lot to work with. And you know, of course, it has a long history of being performed on stage and screen. Uh, did you take any inspiration from from any previous production or film version when you were designing for this one, or did you want to go in completely fresh? Well, I I always try to feed my brain with uh, all of the relevant information I think is useful. So in this case, I started with the original concept album. Uh, which I think was recorded in 1971. And I, I let that seep in for a while. Um, I read the Bible, uh, which I hadn't read in a while. And, that, and then um, I decided that I wanted to see the 1973 movie, which seemed to be um, a, a sort of well, you know, a renowned, well-regarded, uh, timely interpretation of it that was made more or less at the same time that the music was written. And so I thought that would be a good place to start in terms of um, just understanding a visual language um, and, and the sort of cinematic nature of, of the film, obviously, which I thought would be useful in, in um, starting to understand how the camera was an additional design element in this live broadcast version. Yeah, and, uh, you know, being in a, in a TV production that's sort of both a stage musical and uh, a TV uh, event, uh, was it challenging to consider how your work would, would be perceived and how it would come across both in person to the audience and also on camera to the audience at home? It, I love the challenge. It was, it was, it was fascinating for me. I, I've done a little bit of work with television before, but not a lot. And so it was um, and, and certainly not of the scale with this number of cameras. And so this was a bit of a first, but I, but I have to say that the element of the camera was, uh, felt sort of natural to me. I, I don't know why, but it, it um, I, you know, I'm, I think I mentioned I used to be an architect. And so I, I tend to think, I, I tend to approach theater design very spatially just to begin with. And so I approached this process very spatially. David Laveau and I worked very closely together to try to um, sort of discover the theatrical space in which we wanted to tell the story, which included an, a live audience. And so it was really a combination of designing um, not just a set, but also a, a theater for the set. And as, as part of that, really trying to understand how to convey the energy of that live experience to a to a telev television audience at home through the camera, which we, we were able to experiment with through pre-visualization, 3D rendering, and and some sort of simple animations. Um, and so, you know, a, a lot of time was spent uh, thinking about the camera as well as the people in the room, but prim primarily the camera uh, and how to how to capture the people in the room and that energy it into the, the little rectangle that ultimately the majority of people experience this through. 
Now, the, the show was performed at the uh, Marcy uh, Avenue Armory in Brooklyn, New York, which is a, a, a large uh, space. Uh, how did it compare to, you know, other theaters and venues you've designed for in the past? Was this a, a, a significantly different kind of, of space? Well, it was, it was quite familiar in terms of the of the concert design that I've done. And it, and it felt, it, you know, the scale and texture of it felt very, very rock and roll in that way. Um, and so, what, well, it's much bigger than any sort of live theater venue that I've worked in. It was, it was familiar in terms of some of the concert design venues that I've worked in. And so in a way it felt quite natural in terms of the scale of, of the piece and the, the way that we were leaning in towards the, the, the live concert component. Um, you know, we talked a lot, we being the, the creative team talked a lot about, um, this event being sort of a hybrid of of opera, rock opera, you know, pageantry, uh, concert, live concert, um, and, and in my mind, architecture, and then of course this live televised aspect. And so, um, it wasn't. I didn't think of it as a musical theater event, you know, as much as a a, a sort of installation rock concert event it was it was a unique it was a unique genre in that way and the uh, show was originally uh, written and and performed on broadway in the 1970s and now you're uh, of course uh, putting it on in in 2018 uh was there any thoughts about updating the style or or keeping that kind of 70s rock feel uh, to it or you know in terms of you know because it's already kind of anachronistic play by design. So so how did you deal with the, that kind of time idea? We really wanted to be in the present moment and to acknowledge that this is this is a piece happening now in 2018, but it it um, but also to evoke the the more ancient timeless aspect of of the original story of the biblical story. Um, but it's really, you know, that as you mentioned, the 70s music and culture is sort of woven into the bones of it pretty fundamentally. Uh, and so to not be afraid of that and, um, you know, just to, to give you a specific example, um, uh, we, we decided to make the set, um, this, this combination of sort of broken ancient frescoes as if we had, uh, rescued this broken sacred space um that had been destroyed and sort of put it back together um in this armory in brooklyn using steel scaffolding uh from the you know sort of modern steel scaffolding but scaffolding of a style that also evokes uh, the sort of 1970s rock texture rock and roll texture of, of sort of the concert um you know wall of speakers uh, that, that we associate with that texture, but also the scaffolding reminiscent of a archaeological dig as well. And so we're trying to just subtly touch these different moments in time and bring them together so that we are very much in the present, but we're also able to evoke uh, moments of, of timelessness or ancientness or uh, moments that are very much rooted in the 70s, um, but always really trying to remain in the present and acknowledging the the time that we're in right now. Now the, um, you know, the, the setting and the, and the sets and, and all the design isn't just artistic, it also has practical functions, of course, in terms of how the music is performed, how it's all staged, and it has that, of course, uh, memorable moment when the stage opens up into uh, the shape of a cross for the crucifixion scene. Um, how complex was that to to engineer? <laughs> it was it was you know it was fairly straightforward in terms of its idea of just taking a wall and tracking it open. Uh, it, it it was fairly complicated to um, choreograph because it was uh, and I think what ultimately made it successful was that it was this combination of pretty much all of the departments working together in the synchronized way, and so it was the automated scenic um, 
tracking system, you know, working in time to the music, but it was also the flying system that was taking John Legend up on the cross that was timed just perfectly. But it was also the, choreogra the choreography of the camera work that was um, capturing just the right angle and, and the lighting coming through and, and just getting all those different components to work together in service of, of this emotion uh, that's trying to support the story and the music was um, was challenging just because there's so many moving parts. But hopefully in the end, it felt like a very simple gesture, which is what it was meant to meant to do. Another uh, impactful moment uh, in the show, uh, when you mentioned the scaffolding, is is Judas's suicide scene uh, when uh, Brandon Victor Dixon is is climbing up that scaffolding and then he disappears out of sight. Uh, was that you know, did, did you know how that was being thought of and, and being prepared as you were designing the set for it? Or or was that, uh, did that kind of come later? No, I mean, pretty early on, David and I talked about wanting to not be too literal with some of these really heightened moments, like the, the suicide of Jewish, Judas, you know, uh, he hangs himself, um, but we didn't feel the need to to illustrate that. So you know, in your face. And we, we wanted to find a language to evoke the violence of that without actually showing it. And so uh, pretty early on, we, we, we knew that we wanted to take advantage of the verticality of the set um, and, and to have him climb up. Uh, and, it, and we weren't exactly sure what was gonna happen then, um, but it, and it sort of came late in the process that we realized that the the symbol for his death was going to be this ladder swinging and this this very subtle uh, sort of glitter falling from the heavens uh, as this sort of uh, bookend to some of the other moments earlier where he's paid the money to betray Jesus with this very simple glitter, not literal money. Um, and, and so we found these, these kind of simple moments to just... Um, use a use a a symbol for rather than trying to um, be sort of uh, naturalistic with our objects um, so yeah I don't know if that answered your question <laughs> oh absolutely uh, and and the lighting which which you mentioned also has such an uh, an important uh, role and impact during the show during the crucifixion scene during so many other scenes uh, and you know of course, the, it has it interacts so greatly with the sets. So what was it like, you know, working and collaborating on on how the lighting would uh, interact with, uh, with the drama? It's, I was so pleased with the work that Al Gurdon did. Uh, he and I worked pretty closely together, uh, and you know, as far as I'm concerned, the set doesn't exist without the lighting. This set in particular is so reliant on uh, the quality of shadow and light and atmosphere. Um, and, uh, you know, the story, Jesus Christ Superstar has a lot of different locations and, and our approach to the design was to create one room, essentially just one space. And the way we transformed that space was how it was lit. And so the lighting designer, Al Gur Gordon would, um, you know, for example, the, the scenes with the priests, um, Caiaphas, uh, were all about casting light through the scaffolding and casting these shadows against the wall and it was all this sort of shadow and and highlight a uh, very different texture than we saw in any of the other moments and and so the the transformation of the physical space through light was was a very uh, important tool that we used now uh you, you've uh done scenic design work on, on, on Broadway shows where, of course, you know, you, you're creating a setting to go through a, a weeks long, months long, potentially years long production. Uh, you know, and this is just kind of like a one night event. You know, did, did it feel like a lot more pressure, you know, having to build all this up and, and create all of this uh, to go off without a hitch just in one shot? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's always, that's sort of the excitement of doing these live broadcasts is the, the it, and what makes it special is that it's really only happening once and you have one 
chance to get it right. And uh, and so, you know, there was a little bit of me uh, praying in the back corner during, particularly during the the last moments. Um, but every, you know, as far as I'm concerned, everything came off really well, and uh, I was very very happy about it. Um, but that that sort of energy, I think, is captured in the broadcast, and it's very palpable. Well, I'll, uh, I, I do also believe it went off uh, without a hitch. Uh, so congratulations on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, congratulations on the show in general. Uh, th thank you so much for talking to me today. Thank you. It was my pleasure.